Well, jazz is a form of expression, and like painting, like uh, um, just who you are. If, if you have listened to the great jazz artists over the years, and I'm going back to the bebop area, and, and of course, the great orchestras like Count Basie, Woody Herman, Duke Ellington, and all those great musicians who played uh, that style of music. It's something I remember that Duke Ellington used to say. He used to say that music was his mistress. And that it, it's something that you give your life and your love to. And, and making that possible that, and hopefully, that the audience will accept that style of music because we never know what could be accepted when we write music, when we perform. We don't know, well, do the people really like what we're doing? And so it's always a challenge. So with jazz, it got to a point of those people that played bebop, they didn't care what the audience thought, if they liked it or not. They just do that they were creating some great music. And that's what jazz is. Now when you talk about Latin jazz, the great thing about that is that there's a marriage between the Latin rhythms and jazz. Because a lot of the voicings that we use, the chords that we use, they're all jazz based on jazz chords and jazz voicings. But the rhythm is Latin. So we've created a sound called Latin jazz. And it works. Now you will see percussion players in R&B bands that play rhythm and blues or blues or any other kind of music, you will see a percussion player. So it, it's gotten to a point now where I think we're being more accepted as far as what this music is concerned. And, and I really appreciate that because that's what keeps us going. And we appreciate the fact that you are all here and that you embrace this music as you embrace the young girls who play jazz. Speaking of, speaking of, speaking of the young girls, minor efforts up here. What did you think of those young ladies? They are 14 and 15 years old by now. <laughs> yes, I know. And uh, there's a great school in Oakland, a school of arts there in Oakland that, where they, they got their education. And um, see, when I was a kid, that that kind of um, lessons and knowledge was not available to any of us when we were kids. Um, we had to learn by just watching, listening. So me and my brothers, we would go to all the clubs that we could and just go and watch these guys play, listen, and try to record everything in our brains. But these kids were taught by jazz teachers, instructors, and they been taught so well. And the fact that they are so young and that they've embraced this music so hard heartedly is just unbelievable what they do. I am so proud of them. And they they actually uh, just blew blew my mind away when I first heard them. And all of all of the guys in my orchestra who are older guys and have played music for years, they look at these girls and go, man, these girls are something. And they really are. They're very, very talented. They're going to go a long way. So they really will. Yeah. Now, oh, hello. Uh, yeah. You, well. <laughs> you, you mentioned your childhood. You mentioned your brothers. You mentioned growing up. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about that in, in this book, My Life in the Key of e. Make sure you pick it up. Now, let me just point out a couple of things about this book. On the back cover, the reviews include reviews from Jimmy Smith, the actor. Rafael Sadiq, the artist, Dave Koz, Dolores Huerta, and Angela Davis. So that's how powerful and how broad-based this knowledge is here. All right, yeah. so, so make sure you pick this up. Uh, Pops will be happy to sign it for you as well. Now, you, you had a, kind of a tough childhood. You were in a kind of boy's home for a while. Yeah. What was that like and what did that do to you and how did that inspire you with your creativity? Well, growing up uh, back then, me and my brothers, we, uh, uh, it was unfortunate that my mom and dad divorced when we were all young. So we were kind of like going from this household to this household. And I know it was rough on my mom because she was trying to make a living after my mom and dad divorced. So 
at one point she had to send two of uh, um, my brothers and sister to Mexico to live with uh, my grandmother. So they went off to Mexico and my mother wanted to go visit them, but you know, didn't have enough money for all of us to go. So she found a place for us to go to, uh, which was St. Vincent's Home for Boys, which is in San Rafael. No longer there, it's a different community service place now. And so we were dropped off there. Little did I know that we were going there. Little did my little brother know. But those times were kind of rough, and I was just a young kid. But my my sister uh, had come to visit me. And she took us out on a ferry, the ferry that goes to Sausalito, stuff like that, in San Francisco. So I'm standing out there on the ferry, and I'm looking out in the ocean and looking at the sea, and I'm going, you know what? I got to do something with my life. I can't, this, this doesn't make any sense to be living the way I'm living. So when I get out of here, I got to start doing something. Well, that's actually when I started painting. When I went to high school, I started painting. But from the painting, I went to music. And so that ha has enabled me to actually change my whole life around. So it's it's been a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> All of us are. Now, so what was it that got you into music initially? And when did you realize that this is something I can actually do as a lifetime profession and, and passion? Well, I was pretty much set up in, uh, in high school to continue with my artwork. My art teacher, who was so very nice to me and uh, a very wonderful woman who took me under her wing, and she... Uh, she uh, let me go in the back room and paint with the oils. And no other student could do that. She just let me do it. And she told me, you have a career in art if you want it. She said, I can get you a scholarship. I can get you an apprentice job at an advertising company. And actually, she did that. She had me all set up. But there was a young man who played piano uh, his name was Ed Kelly. They went to the same school I did. He was forming a little little combo to start playing, you know, music. So I was fiddling around with the saxophone. I had about five lessons. I couldn't get to the sixth lesson, <laughs> so I wasn't very good. But I went up to him and I said, "Hey, you know, man, I I, I want to join. Could I, can I join your group?" He goes, "Well." I already got a sax player. I don't need a sax player. But I do need a percussion guy. So can you do that? I said, yeah, I can do that. I was beating on coffee cans. and Yeah, I can play. I can play. So I joined the band. Now, this was a time when the schools let a high school group open for a main act uh, in, in the Bay Area. So we were chosen to open... Uh, at the Downby Club on Market Street in San Francisco uh, for the Count Basie Orchestra. <laughs> now, what an opportunity is that, right? <laughs> so we go there and we start playing. Now, as soon as we hit the stage, and as soon as I saw the audience, the vibe of the club, the musicians in the dressing room, the smoke, the drinks, the applause, the I said, man, this is heaven. <laughs> this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to do this. And so um, I thrive to be a musician. Did you ever imagine you'd be here now with the legacy that you have, the, the legend that you are? Did you, did you picture that? I had no idea that I was going to get this far. I really did. I did. I didn't know how my career was going to be because, it, you know, all of those young years is just struggling years. You know, you... You have to work at your instrument. You have to try to get better. You have to play with better musicians. You got to move up the ladder. You have to practice all the time. And, you know, the money is not always what you expect it to be. Very hard to make a living. And at that young age, uh, I married when I was uh, 22, 21, 22. My wife was young. And uh, we started a family right away. So it's hard to keep finances going, you know. Um, we had to leave places where we lived because we didn't have money to pay the rent. We had, 
I had cars repossessed. I had I was broke. But I mean, a bunch of stuff. I went through, you know, hell and high water. But um, yeah, you just stay with your dream, you know, and hope that someday you'll you'll be able to make a living. And uh, fortunate for me that I was able to do that. Now, obviously, you played with countless jazz legends, but you played with with a lot of other folks too. You played with Carlos Santana. You played with Prince. What was what was it like to play with Prince? I mean, you know, he he just recently passed, and and what was it like to play with him and his genius? And what was it also like to have your daughter Sheila E. engaged to him? Mm -hmm. Well, I I first met Prince, and this was before he became famous. I was still playing with Santana, and we were rehearsing. And uh, the piano player uh, for Santana Band, uh, Tom Coster, he he brought in Prince to the rehearsal, and he introduced us to him and said, he said, "Hey, you guys, this is young young guy. He's he's really going to be something." So I'm teaching him some piano stuff. So we, you know, embraced him, talked with him. I invited him over the house, and he came over the house, and he met Sheila. And they became friends, and then his career started, you know, to go up. Uh, I must say that he was, I think, one of the most talented people, uh, as far as music concerned. And I mean, he could write a song in a second. He could write five songs in a day. He can. He was constantly playing every day, and he would record to them. We hours of the morning. He wouldn't sleep for two or three days just in the studio recording. His ideas came real fast, you know, and he wanted always to record them real fast. So for me, I thought he was a great musician. It's just that he he didn't have uh, a very strong family life, and eventually that bothered him through the years. And if you remember seeing him on videos and TV shows, where he would he would jump off the high. Um, speakers and stuff and land down and run across the stage and slide. Well, doing that all those times, he injured his hip and he really had a bad hip. He was always in pain. So he started taking uh, painkillers. He ended up uh, taking too many painkillers. And obviously, um, a, uh, a doctor gave him something that didn't do him well with what he was taking and eventually passed away, but died too young. But uh, you will be surprised if, and I don't know if they're going to do this, but they might because there are songs, because Sheila and I went to Paisley Park for a very private ceremony for Prince after he passed away. And we were there sitting there while things were getting ready and I heard this music they were playing. And I whispered over to Sheila, I said, Sheila, man, this music is really nice. Who, who is that? He goes, that's Prince. I said, what? I said, I didn't know he played this kind of music. But it was jazz, it was, I mean, it was beautiful music. So I said, you know, this stuff has to be heard. So we went into what he called a vault, but he had thousands and thousands of tapes and recordings of music that has never been released. So I don't know the legal legalities of what his family is going to do as far as putting out uh, some of that music, but it should be put out because it's a whole other side of Prince that probably nobody knows about, and it's really, really great music. Do something like what Tupac Shakur's family did after he passed. Yeah. Because they released a whole bunch of his music as well. Yes. Um, in the review of the book, Dolores Huerta says that you have always been in the forefront of progressive movements, lending your talent to raise money for organizations like the United Farm Workers and the Dolores Huerta Foundation, combining music with activism to create a more just society. So I have to ask you, as a Mexican-American yourself, um, I come from Oakland. Uh, mm -hmm. I work for the Oakland School District. We are a sanctuary district inside a sanctuary city. We protect our students no matter what. Your, your feelings. Um, your, your feelings about the tenor of the country right now with regard to immigrants? Well, I know that um, when I went to school, you were able to 
or go into the music room and check out an instrument. If you wanted to play an instrument, you, you could check that instrument. I'll take it home, practice. And they had band and they had choruses and uh, they had uh, music in the schools. Uh, eventually, we had lost that because of cutbacks with the schools and stuff that goes on politically, which uh, I don't agree with. But I think it's a shame that uh, we wouldn't have these girls playing the way they play if they didn't go to that school. And, and that's what it takes. You know, it probably takes private funding. It takes people like you to contribute to the arts because it's so important. And they don't get that in the schools anymore because of all these cutbacks. Now, I feel very, very concerned and very bad about that. That's why I kind of like took a stand with it and, you know, want, want people to understand what these kids are missing if they don't have an education in music. Because music keeps them off the streets. There's so much going on today as far as violence and the things that go on in the street now. It's, it's just crazy. Um, I, I understand that there's all styles of music, and I understand that what the kids like now is different from where I come from and what I do. But some of it gets to be a little too much of what's on the wrong side for me. Uh, when they gangster rap or they, um, they swear in their lyrics and stuff like that. And some of the things that they say, you know, that are recorded that these kids are hearing, you know, is not, is not a good thing. But if they study music the way these young girls have and look at them, they're all, and there's, they're so great people. If you just talk to them, if you go out and talk to any of those girls, you just, you want to take them home. They're just beautiful. Yeah. Take them home and yeah. play and do a little yeah. music with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I have one more question. It's kind of personal on my part. I have to ask you this. Um, I mentioned this earlier. So in 1985, I was a senior at Berkeley High School, and I worked at a place called Narcy's. You all might remember Narcy's Restaurant. Yeah, Narcy's. Um, so this was a time when Prince was as big as he was uh, and when Sheila was as big as she mm -hmm. was. And in planning for the prom, I had a thought, because at the time at Narcy's, I worked with your wife, and your daughter Zena. Right. Zena. They both worked there. Yeah. And so it crossed my mind, should I ask them to ask Sheila if she would go to the prom with me? <laughs> and I, this, this honest God truth, I really thought about that. And I just, I never did it. So my question to you is, do you think she'd go to the prom with me? <laughs> you know what? She might. She might. What I, I, mean? I won't say no, and I won't say yes. Fair enough. She might. Fair enough. Yeah, all right. Balls in your court. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. I appreciate that. So I have, a, I have a question for anybody out here. Have any questions that you you'd like to ask Pete? Yeah. 